beneficial for you, um, but it's really nice that we're able to provide the webinars um, in the public access domain so that all can, anyone can access them later on. So just wanted to share some upcoming sessions with you. So we have another uh, session in the series coming up. It's called Centering Indigenous Voices with Drew Hayden Taylor, um, and that's June 1st. And um, the information there for you to be able to register. We have another one coming up, Significance of the Opening Address with, um, De De I'm sorry, Dehayande. Um, uh, he's an, a Mohawk elder. Um, our fourth session is a series. Um, it's called We Come From the Stars webinar series, and it's the fourth in that series, and that's on May 27th. So those are some of the sessions that are happening, and we hope that you're all able to register and join us for those sessions. And if not, that you can um, go to the website and view the recordings afterwards. Um, I'm really excited now um, to start the learning, and we're going to turn it over to our facilitators, uh, Jody Williams, Isaac Murdoch, and Kevin Williams will be sharing with us today as well. So enjoy, everyone. I know I will. Thank you, Tina. And I just want to recognize the work that uh, Tina is part of our council. And we, we exist based on the dedication of uh, people like Tina who dedicate their time um, that uh, allow these things such as these webinars and all the work that we do. All subject to associations are like that. It, it relies on the, um, the volunteer work of teachers across the province. Uh, so thank you again, Tina and Priya, who's helping in in the background there. Um, so as I'm, I'm going to pull up my screen and start sharing my screen. And as I do that, I'm going to invite um, Isaac to introduce himself. So um, my name is Jody Williams, and I'm the co-chair of uh, the FNMI EAO. And um, I also work full time as the Indigenous Education Lead in Dufferin Peel Catholic. And this resource that we're going to be sharing with you today is uh, an example of some of the work that we have been doing for many years now together and Isaac has been a big part of that so I'm going to get that up and Isaac if you want to come on and introduce yourself. Hello everybody my name is Isaac Murdoch I'm from Serpent River First Nation I'm from the Fish Clan and I currently reside at a place called Nimki Ajbikong. It's a great honor to be here. Um, it's always fun to be able to be a part of these uh, learning sessions. A lot of incredible uh, hard work went into this, this resource that we're going to be learning today. And I'm really proud of it. Um, even though I didn't do a whole lot, I just sat around and told some stories. And Jody is like, like the mastermind behind this. Um, so thank you, Jody, for putting all of the work and effort into it. Um, I think that one of the big um, lessons that we get from this resource is just how to be really kind and good with each other in the earth and just respecting everything. And we, we know as teachers and as educators and as parents that, you know, that's probably the biggest thing that we could teach our, our young people. And so it's a great honor to be here, and I, I look forward to diving into this with you. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Isaac. So, um, so this is the website um, that you will find this resource that we're going to be sharing with you about today. And um, some of you may be familiar with the first iteration of it, which was um, and the link is still active, but we will be eventually turning it off and pointing it to this new site, um, which is helpingourmotherearth.com. Um, and, and so this actually is, uh, there's three sections in this new site, and we're going to be focusing on the first section, which is lessons from the earth. And so it's a big, it's, it's still very much the same as the original one that we started, I believe it was five years ago, maybe six. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so on that other, uh, on the main website though, there's three sections to it. So you can play around with, uh, those other sections as well. Um, just to note though, um, just to kind of go back, we call it lessons from the earth and beyond. 
There is a section called uh, Lessons from Beyond. It is still under construction, but there is some pretty cool things in there. Um, and that is an ongoing resource that we're building, working with, um, that's, that's connected to the webinar, We Come From the Stars, and it's looking at indigenous knowledge systems and mathematics, but we're taking it through the lens of uh, star knowledge. So there's some pretty cool stuff emerging in that area as well. And eventually once it's uh, completed, we will be um, sharing out PD sessions and we'll, um, and now we're doing a, now we're doing PD virtually. So that will probably be in the future as well. So this, um, as Isaac mentioned, uh, this all began with a story. And like most um, uh, for Indigenous knowledge, that's, um, you know, storytelling is an integral part. And one of the things that we want to try and emphasize is that when you hear things like story or even myths and legends, um, often it's, there's an association made that it's somehow not true or it's made up or it's just um, for entertainment and nothing can be further from the truth. So story, when we talk about story in this way, this is a recount. This is a, a, a telling of geography, history, science, um, art, math, all of these um, important subject areas all bound up together in one. And if you think about when we're trying to uh, teach children, the best way to do it is to tell a really good story. And if you've had the opportunity, well, you're going to today, um, listen to a storyteller who's as gifted as Isaac is, you're, you're just automatically drawn in um, and you get to be, it feels like you're right there in the story, just like reading a good book. And so, um, so what you're seeing here is actually, this was Isaac talking about one pictograph. Now there's several here, but it all starts with one. And we could do a whole series on just the significance of pictographs. Um, but if you can appreciate the enormous amount of knowledge and the skill set it requires for someone to be gifted um, in, in being able to remember and being able to retell these important um, messages um, and knowings that come through the story. So he told this story and at the time um, we had moved into this new classroom and the kids wanted to paint something on the wall and so th after hearing this story they're like can we paint this? And so I asked Isaac and he thought, yeah, why not? And then he checked with, um, he checked in with a friend of his, Christy Belcourt. And if you don't know who Christy Belcourt is, uh, you should, you should know who Christy Belcourt is. Um, and she said, yes, uh, I want to be part of that. So this story did get painted, but it didn't get painted on the classroom wall because now that we had leveled up and included somebody like Christy, um, it became a whole school project. Uh, and at the time, this was at St. Thomas Aquinas in Brampton. And at that time, the school population was, I think, about 2,200. Uh, so it was a very large school in an urban setting. Um, and we were designated as an urban priority school. Um, and so this, this project was just an incredible experience for so many kids and their families and staff. We even had custodians partaking in it. It was just such a great experience. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Isaac right now uh, because we want you to hear the story as told by Isaac so that you can have an appreciation for the story. And I'm gonna stop my screen share for a moment and I will um, turn it over to Isaac. Thank you very much, Jody. Um, can everybody see me okay? Is there a way that I could see my own self in this screen, Jody? What I see is, is a little man like, like that. There we go, great, wonderful. So hello, hello everybody. I'm, I'm just tickled pink to be able to tell this story. This story is called Ojiganong Atsukan. And basically it means the, the Fisher story. 
and what a fisher is it's a little animal that is like a wolverine but it's smaller it's not as big as a wolverine and the story is an old story i learned this story years ago from from many different elders but they used to tell this story all the time around the campfire we'd be in the bush somewhere you know usually late at night we'd be sitting around the fire and this story would come out and I would be just so fascinated by this story. I'd be just like, my eyeballs would be just like fixated on the storyteller. I just couldn't stop watching them. And the story is about how humanity, the human beings, try to destroy the earth. And it was the, the animals that, of course, tried to save the earth. And this is their journey and this is their story. And so I've often believed that when we tell stories, um, it, it involves a certain amount of spirituality. And so in, in our communities, when we tell these stories, it's usually around a fire. We make uh, food offerings to the spirits and to the different animals that we talk about as we're telling the story. Because we believe that, that there's spirits in the story that come out. And so we give them gifts as, as we talk about them and as we honor them and commemorate them. And so, you know, growing up, you know, they really tried to instill in, into me that we're a big part of each other's lives, but we're also a part of, of the, the beautiful blanket of life that exists on the lands and waters and that everything depends on everything. And that everything gives everything to everything. And that there's natural laws that as human beings were to follow. And so as, as a young person, they'd always say the animals are to lead our government. And if we, if we stick with that, if we stick with our natural laws, and if we stick with, with being apart and being connected and fabricated into this, this beautiful green blanket of life in the forest, that will always live on, the, on this earth. And that if we, try, if we make another path and if we follow another way, that we won't be able to live here. And so that's what they always talked about. And they'd have stories that would talk about our connection to the earth and to the animals and the sky and the stars and the winds. And, and of course, uh, you know, being so fascinated um, with stories, um, I just naturally learned these stories as a, growing up as a child. And so it's a great honor to present this story to you. And the story, like I said, is an old story. It's usually not done like this on the videos. Um, but in this day and age, we've decided to, to try to bring it to a wider audience using technology. And it's our way of giving back um, and to, of course, try to help um, the Mother Earth by telling these stories to a wider audience. And so um, I thank all of you for, for being here and for listening. So now I'm going to get ready for my story. I clap my hands always. Okay. So they say that a long time ago, the, the Anishinaabek people, the, the two-legged, the human being, they were given certain instructions when they came down here on earth, they say that we come from the stars and that when we came to this earth, we were told that the animals would always be the leaders of our government and that we would follow the natural laws that are here. And that when we enter this great lodge here on earth, this very sacred lodge, that we would follow those very important and beautiful um, set of principles that, that are here. And that the earth is filled with spirits. The trees have spirits. The rocks in the ground, deep in the ground, there's things that live there. Up in the sky, the thunderbirds, the little people, the mermaids, all of the forest dwellers. You know, this, this world is magical. And that's what we're told. And of course, the stars. You know, sometimes I look up at the sky. And I'll see one of those Mazanabiganan, those pictures, those constellations. And my grandparents always said, that's a sacred site up there. You know, sing songs to commemorate 
those sacred sites, honor them, give them something. And one, this story that, that I'm going to tell you is about such a site that hangs in the, in the sky. And they say that a long time ago, our people, we lost our way. We were told, always follow the animal trails, never stray off the trails. Because our whole existence and our whole life is on those trails. And that if we follow them, we'll never get lost. But something happened. You know, somebody was out picking blueberries and they noticed off in the distance, off one of those animal trails, that there was a, a whole bunch of blueberries. And so they made their own trail to that blueberry patch. They didn't follow the rules. We have to remember a long time ago, there was a lot of animals and a lot of trails. So there was a lot of options. But for whatever reason, this person decided to make their own trail. And away they went. They took off to that blueberry patch. And they started to pick those, all those blueberries. And lots of them. And they brought them back to their wigwam. But that person picked too many of them. And so he went into the forest and he got some bulgogamish, this type of plant that'll prevent the blueberries from rotting. And he covered all those blueberries up with them. But guess what? He picked so many that, that they started to mold anyway. And they started to rot. So he went back into the forest and he got more berries, more berries, more berries. And then somebody noticed, hey, look at that person over there. They, they got a lot of berries. Maybe we should do the same. And they went into the forest and got more berries. And then other people started to go into the forest. Next thing you know, the whole village, they were going off, making their own trails, going all over the place, getting lots of berries. And all the berries started to rot. That wasn't our way. We'd only pick enough, and we always shared what we had. So they started to go another way. They started to ignore the natural laws that these lands ins insist upon. And then it, it turned from berries to fish. Then people were getting too much fish. People were getting too much beaver. People were getting too much moose. People were getting too much birds. Next thing you know, the whole village was just full of rotten food. Everything was rotten. There was just bones lying all over the place. People lost their way. And then another village started to be like that. This greediness, it started to infect everywhere it went. That greediness traveled. It would get stuck in somebody's hair. And it would tangle up in their hair. And they would become like that. Or that greediness, that spirit would go in their mouth when they're sleeping. And it would make them like that. And so this greediness started to infect village to village to village all over Shkak Mkwe, all over the earth. Everybody became greedy. And they started to take too much. And it wasn't right. All you could just see was bones everywhere you went. Rotten food. And of course, it was very disastrous to the animals very disastrous to the plants. And so the animals were petrified. They were very scared. There was an old spirit in the sky. They call that spirit Babo Nene, which is the winter maker. This old spirit, they say it's like an old man who's got a white beard and he's very powerful. And he's got a very cold breath, very sacred breath. And so this old man in the sky, he's got a wigwam up there. It's over there. It's down, down, down that way. That old man in that wigwam looked down on the, on the earth and seen that greediness. And the humans were passing that greediness all around. They were casting it all over the earth. So that old man thought, you know what? I'm going to blow my cold breath on the earth. I'm going to freeze those humans, those Anishinaabek, and I'm going to kill them. 
because they're the ones that are that are carrying the greediness. It's the only way I can get rid of the greediness. That's what the old man, he had it in his mind, that's what he was going to do. So of course, he started to blow his cold breath down on the earth. And he's blew hard, trying to freeze it, trying to kill all the humans, trying to get rid of the greediness. But there is a power here on earth that was just as strong as the old man's breath, if not even stronger. It was the birds. When the birds, when they sang their medicine songs, when they sang their songs, they somehow pushed that cold air back into that old man's mouth. Those songs were powerful. And you know what? I want you to listen to them. I actually have them right here. And I don't know if you can hear that. But the birds, they start to sing and sing and sing. And the more they sang, the more they cast their medicine all over the earth. That old man's breath couldn't freeze nothing. Those songs were too powerful. Because a song is a prayer. And it comes from the heart. And so when those birds sing, it comes from their heart outside of their mouth. And it's, it has a spirit. Those songs are very spiritual. And they know where to go. And they know what to do. And those, those songs, they start to work together. And they start to lift that cold air, that old man's breath, and they put it back into his mouth. That old man was grumpy. He was mad. He thought those birds, they buggered everything up. They ruined everything with their songs, with their spiritual songs. I know what I'm going to do, he thought. I'm going to go down to the earth. I'm going to get a big bag down there. I'm going to put all the birds in that bag. Every last one of them. And I'm going to take them up into the stars, into, the, into my wigwam. Once they're up into the, in my wigwam, he said, I'll be able to freeze the earth no problem. Because they won't be able to stop me. They'll be up in the stars. So that's what he did. He got a great big bag. He went down to the earth. And he grabbed all those birds and he took them up into, his, into the stars, into his lodge. And then he started blowing. And when he blew his breath, this place froze quick. Like that. The wind was coming from every different direction. It was twirling around even. The snow, the ice, it, it started to grow. That ice started to get thick everywhere. And that old man, he just kept blowing. Of course, that great, that beautiful green blanket of life started to wither and die and everything in it. All the animals start to die. The humans start to die. The fish start to die. Everything started to die. Even the sunlight couldn't even shine. It was a bad time. But the old man knew he had to get rid of that greediness. And he kept blowing and blowing. But there was a little animal, Ojig, Fisher, the little animal I was talking about, the one that looks like a wolverine, a little wolverine. Fisher started to go to all the animals in the forest and offered them tobacco and said, meet me in four days. We're going to have a council meeting. We're going to see what we can do to save the earth because the old man is, is going to kill everything. And Fisher even went to the Anishinaabek, went to the humans and gave them tobacco and said, meet us in four days. On the fourth day, Fisher made a great big fire and waited. Of course, it was dark. It was windy, it was snowy, it was cold. 
But out of the darkness, an animal came out. Then another one. And then another one. And then a group of animals came out here. And another group over here. And next thing you know, there was thousands of animals that had come to that sacred council meeting. Thousands. That circle was big. They say it was one of the biggest meetings that ever took place. But the Anishinaabek, the human being, the two-legged, never decided to go to that meeting because they knew that they were the ones that were, were causing the problems. They felt guilty and they, did, they were too ashamed to go. And of course, those animals, they sat there around that fire and one by one they talked. One by one. And it took them many days for them to finish talking. And it, by the end, it was agreed that the humans had lost their way and that they had to save the earth. And the old animals, the elders, had come up with a plan that they figured was going to work. And the plan was to send warriors up into the stars they were going to send them up there to try to get those birds. Bring those birds down to the earth so they can sing their magic spiritual songs and melt all the ice, melt all the snow and restore that beautiful green blanket of life. That was their plan. And just try to negotiate with the old man to, so that he could stop blowing his breath. Because they said that the old man had a heart too, even though it was made out of ice. He still had a heart and he, he, he might listen. So they picked four warriors to go on a quest to save the earth. The first animal they chose was Gawk, porcupine. The reason why they chose porcupine is because porcupine was the first one to volunteer. Porcupine said, I'll go. I have a strong back. And even though I'm not a good jumper, I'm not fast, I'm steady and I'm determined. And I'm very, very stubborn. And of course, the elder says, Yes, you can go. Then they chose Otter. They said, Otter, you're a good fighter. You got sharp teeth, you're quick, and you're slick. You can go. Then they chose Bijou, the lynx. They said, lynx, look at your beautiful back legs, how strong they are. You can jump high. You're a good fighter. And you too are very, very smooth. And you're sneaky. You'd be a great asset to go on this trip. And then they looked at Fisher the smallest of the animals. And they said, you can go too. Because you're the one that called this meeting. Follow through with your dream. Follow through with what you started. They said, we'll sing songs for all of you. We'll pray for all of you as you go on this quest to, to save the earth. And of course, they left. They left into the darkness. And what their plan was, of course, was to climb a great big mountain, jump into the stars, kidnap those, those birds back, and rescue them, and bring them back down and try to talk to the old man. So when they got to the top of that mountain, they grabbed porcupine by the arms and legs, and they threw porcupine up so that porcupine can go to the stars. But porcupine couldn't make it. Just before the star world, there's something called Gijikdong. It's a power. And Porcupine couldn't bust through that power that covers the earth. And of course, it couldn't make it. And Porcupine came down to the earth and it landed on its hands and feet and it busted them. And, of course, it wobbled off that mountain. And that's why porcupines wobble around today, if you see them. Their feet are just swollen. They're just swollen, and they wobble when they walk. It's like they got busted feet. 
It's like that to remind us of what happened a long time ago when we lost our way and we tried to have everything. The next animal to make that jump was Nagig, otter. Otter jumped hard, very hard. It tried to bust through that power, but couldn't make it. And of course, otter, when it came down, it landed on the side of that mountain, and it just slid on its stomach all the way down. And of course, that's why otters slide around today. We watch them do that. They slide all over those hills and all over the place. It's to remind us of what happened when we became a greedy people and we stopped sharing everything with everything. The next animal to make that very sacred jump was Bijou the lynx. Bijou knew that it had to bust through that power. It had to bust through Gijikdong. So it jumped hard with all its might. And it tried to bust its head through. But it didn't make it. And of course, lynx came down to the earth too. And its beautiful long tail got cut off by a sharp piece of ice. And its face got squished in. That's why it looks like a lynx got punched in the face. Look at it. Looks like something happened to its face. It's to remind us of what happened a long time ago when we forgot about the, the laws, the natural laws that she knocked the gay one in on in that are here, that live here. It's to remind us that we, we forgot about those sacred laws that nature has. The only animal left was Fisher. Fisher was all alone. So Fisher dug around in the ice and snow because it knew if it wanted something, it had to give something. That's a natural law. And it found six bear berries, those little red berries. It found six of them. It grabbed those berries. And that Fisher prayed with those berries for a long time and said, help, help us. And of course, Fisher was praying to the six powers of the universe and casted those berries into the darkness and jumped. And when it jumped, it looked up and it noticed that there was a crack in Gijikdong. All the other animals made a crack. And when Fisher hit it, it found itself in a Nungal Kaning. It found itself in the star world. It made it through, it busted through. And Fisher looked across the sky and it looked and it seen that old man's lodge. But guess what? There was a great big crane, a jujok, guarding that lodge. And the crane is loud, very loud. When they scream, you could hear it for 10 miles. So it knew that it was a, it was a guard. And then if it got too close to that old man's wigwam, that crane would, would tattle tail. So Fisher crawled through that hole in the sky that was, that was made. They call that hole Bugno Gijik. Fisher crawled through that hole down to the earth. And it started to look at the trees. And it started to get that gown duck begu, the spruce gum, that sticky stuff on the trees. It started to collect it. And of course, it went back up through that hole. And it started to zigzag from star to star. Finally, it snuck behind Crane. But Crane noticed something. It, it, it could feel something behind it. So it turned around. And sure enough, Fisher is right there. And so Crane opened up its mouth to alarm the old man, to let the old man know that something was there to steal those birds. And Crane opened up its great big mouth and was ready to yell. And that's when Fisher grabbed all that sticky tree gum and it shoved it right into Crane's big mouth. Of course, that sap, it went right, right into its throat. But Crane pushed hard. And it made a noise, just like that. The old man knew right away something was going on. The old man thought, oh my goodness, 
somebody's here to try to get these birds. So he turned around to grab his bow and arrow. When he grabbed his bow and arrow, he went to go outside and he noticed the bag of birds were gone. Fisher had already went in there, grabbed the bag of birds and took off across the stars before the old man even knew anything. That old man was mad. But Fisher made it to that hole quickly and started to pour those birds down that hole. Those birds, they started to sing their, their sacred songs. The songs start to travel the earth into all the hard to reach places and they start to work their medicine and things start to melt. Already that beautiful green blanket of life, it started to come back. That's how powerful those birds were. That's how powerful those birds are. And as Fisher was pouring the last of those birds down that hole, it heard a noise. Not any kind of noise, but a noise that would ring through the ages, would ring for the rest of time. And the noise I'm talking about is the snapping of the old man's bowstring. That old man had him lined up with his bow and arrow. And those arrows were powerful. They could go to the end of the earth, no problem, and they always hit their mark. And that old man let one arrow go. Fisher tried to jump because it knew that arrow was coming. But the old man was already ahead of him. And when Fisher jumped, that arrow got Fisher right in the tail. And because those arrows were so powerful, it killed Fisher. Fisher died. Right there in the sky, it laid on its back. The old man was happy it killed Fisher. The old man knew all it had to do was go down to the earth with another big bag and get all the birds and then bring them back up and then blow his cold breath and freeze everything again. The old man knew there was going to be no more heroes. And so he walked back into his lodge to get another big bag. And as he grabbed that big bag, he started to leave. And something happened. All of a sudden, mysteriously, six lights came down from the top of his lodge and they were buzzing and they were making a noise. Everything in that lodge started to shake. And as these six lights came down, they turned into human form and each one of them had a red bearberry in their hand. And this is what they told the old man. They said, we are the six powers of the universe. And we've watched everything from a distance. We've seen everything from far away. We've seen how the two-legged try to destroy the earth. How they got greedy and they lost their way. But we've also seen how the beautiful green blanket of life withered and died. We've also seen how the animals were perishing and that the lakes were being frozen right to the bottom and that the fish were dying and that the sun wasn't allowed in. We also seen how you kidnapped those birds and we wanna make things right. So here's what we're gonna do. We've made a decision. The de decision is for half the year, you can blow your cold breath on the earth to remind the human beings that they have to be sharing their, their food that they can't take too much, that they have to follow the natural laws that are here, and that they, they have to know, remind them that the animals are always to be the leaders of their government, that they should never make their own laws again. And for the other half of the year, we're gonna let the birds sing their songs so that life can flourish, so the be beautiful green blanket that, that gives life to everything 
will be powerful and pure. And to commemorate Fisher, we're going to turn Fisher into stars. And they turned Fisher into the Big Dipper. And that's what happened. And that's why we have winter. That's why it's there. And they say that in the, in the fall time, you'll see Fisher that starts to lay on its back. And blood from its tail drips down to the earth. And it paints the trees red. And the old man knows it's time for him to blow his cold breath. And winter arrives. And then in the springtime, Fisher is back on its arms and legs, sitting upright. And it's running across the sky towards Bogonagizhik. And the birds cast their beautiful voice into the world, bringing life to everything. That's a sacred site hanging in the sky, the Big Dipper. It's to remind us of the sacred laws that are here. And I also believe it's to remind us of the sacred story that we're in now. I believe a thousand years from now, people will be sitting around a fire telling this story of when the two legged try to destroy everything. And guess who the characters of that story is going to be? It's going to be me. It's going to be you. It's going to be Jody and Priya and Tina. It's going to be all of us. We're going to be the the characters of the story. Sometimes it, things seem impossible with climate change, with the massive ecological collapse that's happening, COVID-19 and other possible diseases that are coming. It seems like we're, we're in a very dire situation. But we have to try something. Because if it wasn't for the strong back of porcupine or the sharp teeth of otter, or the amazing jumping power of lynx, Fisher never would have made it through. Everything that we do now is gonna make a difference in the future, but we have to act. We're the ones that have to act. And we have to believe in each other. That's how those animals were able to do it. They believed in each other. They supported each other. And of course, Fisher, had the courage to go alone. So sometimes we have to do this alone. So if you find yourself on a, on, a, on a journey, on a sacred journey by yourself, be brave. Build your people up. Support your people. Remember that the great laws that are here, they govern everything. And that there is hope because in the end, it was the offering of six berries that saved everything. And that's our greatest law. Bukajigewin is giving back. So keep giving back to the earth. Keep giving back to the beautiful that surrounds us. Maybe you'll see a beautiful cloud. Give something for it. Make some food. Put some food out on the earth. Maybe you'll see some, a beautiful wind will come by. It'll make you feel amazing. Give something for it. They say that as long as we keep giving our offerings, we'll never lose our way. And so I just wanted to share that story with you. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. Um, I know we don't have a whole lot of time left, um, but, but thank you very much. Um, and uh, hopefully... Um, you can take that story and share it with, with kids. Um, you're going to have it on, on this video. Um, so feel free to, to share it and use it. And, uh, and thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'll be open up. I'll be available for questions. And I'm sure Jody has some stuff to talk about. So thank you so much. It was fun. Miigwech. So uh, as you can see how important uh, this story is and why we wanted to, uh, we had the opportunity to um, share it. And so uh, with Isaac, um, and as you can imagine, when the, the students first heard this story and how relatable 
it is um, and why they wanted to be involved with it. So I'm just gonna go back now um, to the PowerPoint here and share it. This is, um, so this is what was painted. And this is uh, four murals. Um, they're really large murals. And so it goes one, two, and then three and four are stacked on top of each other. So now that you've heard the story, you can kind of see um, how it's being depicted here um, in, this, in these images. And one of the things, well, there are so many things that uh, came out for the students and <laughs> poor Isaac had to tell the story. I don't know how many times we did this for it. And it, we did this over a week. And if we were to ever do it again, it, we would never do it over a week. That was just insane trying to pack everything in. But he told the story so many times to different classes. Um, and uh, so about 100 kids participated in the painting of it and the rest uh, listened to the story and they had all kinds of other really cool initiatives and activities that they participated in based on the themes and the lessons that came out of this story um, and how relatable it was to them regardless of you know where they come from and the school at the time that I was teaching at um, it uh, a lot of the students are first generation Canadians. Um, they're just new to the, or they've been here maybe for two, their parents had come here um, and they all could relate uh, to the message in the story. And they were very eager to, you know, when we talk about a, a lot in, in other aspects of environmental education, this just, just, this just took it to a whole new level. Um, and so we talked a lot about the importance of indigenous knowledge and how significant it is and how um and how there's so much important information that we need as a as a society as a global society that we need to start to look back on how do we how do we bring this back in and recenter it into our education system and i just want to um you know, in, in regards to some of the other projects that we're currently looking at in regards to mathematics and science, um, a couple things. One is, as a, if you remember, I was saying about the importance of story and that it's not just, you know, it's not just for entertainment. There's, there's real um, science that's involved in it. And there was a study done fairly recently in regards to um, songbirds, the disappearance of songbirds uh, the the inability for them to migrate due to light pollution, um, the amount of deaths that occur due to them smashing into tall buildings because of the windows and, the, and things like that. And they actually have correlated um, climate change in regards to the decline of songbirds. And so if you think about that part in the story when he was talking about how when the songbirds were removed um, and this you know, basically like a mini ice age occurred um, and it disrupted the weather pattern. So again, it's just another example of how there's real science involved in the telling of this um, important information. Um, and the other thing that Isaac mentioned, and I'm going to just show you, I'm going to play you it through here. So this is based on a program called Stellarium. And so this is actually a representation of the night sky, but it's uh, the constellations. These are um, Ojibwe constellations, not the um, uh, the Greek ones that most people are familiar with. And you'll notice here, um, so this is based on, it's a certain time in the year. And if I play it, what you're gonna see here, I'm gonna pause it for a minute. So you'll notice here, this is in, um, in September. And so at, here's the Fisher or the Big Dipper. So you can see the arrow um, that hits him, that kills him. So let's watch what happens in a full year cycle through the night sky. And as Isaac was talking about, so as we play this through the year, um, we come into, here comes the winter maker. Um, and as the Big Dipper is moving through the night sky and we're getting into winter months, when, if you remember, let me just pause it here. This is when Isaac was talking about how all the songbirds were taken up into the sky and the winter maker was blowing his icy breath. Um, and it's now winter. And we see this as the, as the um, fisher moves through the night sky like this. And then as we come into spring, um, as we come into spring, that 
the fissure is now tipping upside down, the winter maker is going away, and by that tipping is when the birds are returning um, and they're singing and they're sounding their songs. And as Isaac mentioned in the story, they cast their medicine and they push back. And that's when, this, when the um, ice begins to break, the rivers begin to flow and life starts to flourish all over again. And so again, this, and according you know, to this Western science, Western science tells, tells that same story um, just through a different narrative. And so if we continue to play it, and we go through the summer months, and as uh, the fissure dips down through the summer months, coming into the fall, that's where you now see him, oh, <laughs> whoopsies. Anyway, you see him coming back down around, and when that's when he gets shot. Um, by the arrow and the blood that drips down in the fall time and paints the trees, those different colors getting ready for the winter. So these stories, um, and we had another opportunity to listen, there's another version of this story told by um, uh, the Mohawk people and, or Six Nations, and they talk about three hunters and a bear. And um, that story was done by uh, Tom Deere and a uh, professor in, um, the University of London, uh, Western University. And what he did in the same way was he showed through that story and the movement that's happening in the night sky. And if you change the location, um, it's not going to tell the same story. It won't match anymore. So it really also shows that these stories are grounded in, uh, in a certain location. And so these stories that we hear all over the land in different, from different um, nations of peoples, um, they're all very relevant to the point, to, to the land of which they come from and that they're told. So, so getting into this resource now, um, so we obviously, after listening to the story, I'm sure you can now see how many, um, there's so many themes um, that emerged. And so we, we decided um, in order to keep this going, um, well, a couple things. One is that we wanted to help educators avoid the pitfalls of appropriation um, because you can Google all kinds of stuff out there and get all kinds of weird, bizarre versions. Um, and, you know, when we, if we're not careful and we're bringing in those weird versions that exist online, we're actually causing harm. Um, we're perpetuating stereotypes and we need to be very cautious and conscious of that. So, so we wanted to create this resource as a means to um, help educators not appropriate. Um, and how do you bring Indigenous knowledge into your classroom knowing that you're not, you're not the elder or the knowledge carrier um, and that also when we hear stories, we should always be able to say where they come from, and have the permissions to be able to tell those stories. Um, so that was a big reason why we wanted to, to put this resource together. Do you wanna to add to anything at this point, Isaac? You're on mute. On mute now. I think that you, you said a lot. I think that you, you did pretty good, Jody. thank you. Um, Again, the stories are teaching stories. They call them Atsukan, which are spirit stories. And they really relate to our relationship with each other and the earth and the animals and the skies and how we're all connected. And what I really love about the story is that the birds, it wasn't only one kind of bird, that it was all kinds of birds. And that diversity is important. So if you have an ecosystem that's full of diversity, then everything feeds off everything and everything gives life to everything. And those birds, they all work together. And I think as human beings, we also have that, that amazing opportunity. And so I encourage everybody to celebrate your diversity, who you are, where you come from, your songs, your dances, because I think it's, that's what makes everything the most, the most strongest is when we're able to celebrate each other's diversity. 
And I think that's also something I get from the story is how critical and important it is to celebrate each other and our special gifts that we each have. So thank you. So um, just going back here to, uh, so the resource. Um, so we also wanted to, so building on bringing in this story and also making numerous connections to the curriculum because as educators, we have to teach the curriculum. So how can we do this um, using this story as a provocation? So this is where now I'm going to dive into the website and show you a few things and turn it over to Kevin to, um, uh, he's gonna also share as well. Let's get into the resource, into the website. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the website. Uh, as I mentioned here, I'm just gonna scroll down to the bottom. So you'll see these three boxes. Um, this is the one I was telling you about earlier, Lessons from Beyond that's still under construction, but there is um, some stuff there you can play around with. Uh, so we're gonna go into this one, Lessons from the Earth. And you'll see um, there's different informational pieces about you know before getting started and things like that, which I'm gonna skip over because of time. But if you want to play this story, um, you can download a PDF version. And this story here is also got the, um, the Ojibwe translations as well. Um, and we are doing, we're, we're doing a, a um, oh, what do you call it? Um, a redo of the video as well. So, um, because, you know, we want, we want to jazz it up a little bit. And I just got to make sure that I can play sound share computer sound I'm just going to turn that on okay so just to give you a little snippet as to what you would see here on the website for most of human history we have had clean water and a pristine environment we so the idea is you can nature. play this in your classroom there are times however when we lost our way and became greedy and selfish each time that happened, the animals and the environment suffered, as well as the humans. Each time that happened, we learned a lesson. Once again, we have lost our way. The animals and the environment are not the only ones suffering. So are we. There is hope if we can learn from the lessons in this story. Ani Bujo, Manzanap can again go and Abbe and Dishnakaz. Can Abbejing and Dunjaba. Okay, so I just wanted to give a little snippet, um, a little sample as to what is in this resource. Um, so you can play through, so it'll actually have him telling the story like you had just heard today. And then depending on um, where you, what division you are working in, you can click on one of these. And they all basically follow the same. Um, format. So if we were to click on the junior division, they all they all begin in the same way like this. Um, the seven big ideas, you can hear a little sample as to what the language sounds like. And then they all follow the same format. The thing that's different with each one is that um, they have, they each have an activity that's based on a variety of curriculum. Um, so the activities are different for each division. But they all have, so let's click on, let's do this one. Let's, you can go in order, um, but I'm just gonna skip over, we're gonna click on this. So each one follows the same format. They have the little teaching that goes with it. And then this is, again, the video is Isaac giving the teaching that is connected to this concept or understanding. Zagadwin. Zagadwin means love. And when you actually look at the word, so the idea is, again, um, for you, the teacher, uh, you don't have to be, 
you can bring Isaac into your classroom in this format and let him provide the teaching. And then your job as the teacher is to then what do you do from there and how do you connect that into your activities? Um, we also have a huge uh, library of additional videos from other um, knowledge keepers and elders who's contributed to this resource um, that you can see. So Ray John Jr., he's from the Oneida Nation. So you get an Oneida um, perspective on this same concept. And, um, and then, so if you were to, you can click on this, it'll bring you to a PDF um, that has the activity. And again, this is just to give you, um, you know, something that you maybe will give you some ideas, but feel free to like take it, you know, take it however and, and be creative with it and make it relevant to where you're teaching and what you're doing. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin and he's going to, so you'll see here in this section, online learning suggestions. So currently we are now doing uh, our education in virtual uh, format. And so he's gonna show you how you can take this content and build it into your online classroom. And he's got two examples, one using uh, Google Classroom and the other one using Brightspace, which is also known as D2L. So these, this section here that, and each, each one of these um, lessons have a section that looks like this, and it just gives you an example of what you can use into your classroom, and then you can go on to the next one, or you can go back to the main menu. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment, and I'm going to turn it over now to Kevin, who's going to walk you through how to do this. Is my... All right, hello everyone. Uh, as Jody mentioned, I'm going to show you very quickly how to echo. just. Huh? There's a terrible echo. There's an... Sorry, one moment. Sorry, Kevin's just uh, troubleshooting some technology issues. So that's our that's our world, troubleshooting technology. So he's just coming back on, and he'll be screen sharing in just a moment. Jody, while yes. um, you're waiting, we did have a question about whether or not you need a membership to access um, this wonderful resource can you just share with the group? oh yeah sure so this resource is not um it's not through uh fnmi eao this is a it's it just exists publicly um so all you need is the the web address lessons from earth and beyond ca which i believe was put into the chat box um so it's a free public access um the resources connected to FNMIEO. Um, we did do a, a previous webinar with uh, another set of really amazing online resources. Um, those, there's two parts to it. Um, there is a, a membership that gives you access to everything on our website, but we did open up a public version called Student Resources and you can access that. And also there's a link to the webinar video that we did a similar to this, a walkthrough um, on how to use those resources as well. So this one is, yeah, just all you need is the website. And now I see Kevin's on, so I'm going to turn it over to him. All right, thanks everyone. So yeah, um, sorry about the minor technical difficulties. Um, so basically, um, in our new virtual learning uh, reality, um, you know, using online resources are great, uh, but sometimes it's trying to minimize the amount of clicks that students have to use to get to those resources, because um, otherwise, 
uh, you know, we tend to lose half of them along the way to the site. So I'm just going to very quickly highlight how I went about embedding some of the that resource that you had an opportunity to look at today, um, both in a Google Classroom and in a Brightspace or D2L learning environment, which seem to be the two main virtual classrooms or learning environments that are being used. Um, so right now you're seeing the Google Classroom that I've set up. Um, you can see uh, there's a, a number of different examples in the stream where I posted um, assignments so the students would obviously get that message. So I'm just going to go into classwork and you can see here the lessons from the earth assignment or activity that I had created. Um, and again, very easy in Google Classroom, you just click on create and you can choose the type of uh, post that you're going to create from assignment, all uh, material, quiz, a question. Um, so I'm just going to go into the assignment. And basically, I've just set it up um, sort of geared maybe at towards a, a, a higher junior uh, intermediate type of classroom uh, with just a bit of an explanation in terms of where we're going to go to with the lesson uh, for that day. Maybe some anticipation type questions of, you know, do you have a relationship with the natural world? What's it like? Um, how would you describe it? I might even embed a Padlet to collect some, some student thinking around those ideas before diving into the story. Um, and I've got it embedded two different ways, just to give you a sense of how you might do it. One is just a direct link to Lessons from the Earth, the website that Jody was showing you. So if I click on it on that first link, it's going to take me right to the, the video of the Fisher story and Isaac brilliantly retelling that story for students to hear. And then I'm gonna go back into my classroom. And then sort of the, the new popular thing um, is the sort of Bitmoji classroom. So while I, I was listening to the story, I threw this together. Um, so you could build something like this where, you know, kids have to kind of click around to try and find where's the link that's gonna get me to the story. And so in this case, it's on that cardinal. And again, they click on the link and they're back into that story uh, and they could listen to the story and then you could set up some uh, post act, you know, post learning activities, um, maybe have them, you know, connected to literacy, doing some connections, any questions, any inferences that they might be able to make. Um, and so, yeah, so that's basically it. Uh, you could create a Google Doc um, with some of those questions that you wanted them to respond to and if it's a set up like an assignment like this um, they could open that doc and then submit it for you to have a look and give some feedback on um, so that's basically Google Classroom in a very quick uh, and very brief sort of overview on how you might embed uh, a resource like the sacred Fisher story and the second one I'm going to show you is uh, in Brightspace so it looks a little bit different. Um, so for example, in my announcements, I might introduce the fact that we're gonna, you know, listen to uh, a traditional story called the Fisher story today. Um, have them sort of getting thinking about, you know, what, why are we doing this? Because we're really thinking about our relationship with Mother Earth. And then of course, in the announcement tool, I'm embedding the link that's gonna take them to the content. And so you can see on the, the left-hand side in Brightspace, things are sort of organized into units that you can create. So I have built one, Lessons from the Earth. So this might be a series of lessons that I could put together. Uh, and in the first one, which is the Fisher story, um, I've pulled a, a banner image from the website. And then again, I've got sort of those anticipation questions. You could embed a link here to a discussion within Brightspace where students could share some ideas before listening to the story or you could do that discussion sort of as a post um, listening activity and again i've just embedded the link so again the idea being i'm trying to minimize um, the number of clicks students have to use to get to these great resources because um, if i point them to the website and then try and get them to find the you know the the story on the site again like i said you're going to lose half the students so this way it's, it's very direct they can click on the link um, actually, this one did take them to a discussion panel, um, which is here. So again, they could start a thread uh, and then I can go back in here. 
I must have been playing around. Um, and again, you could embed a link that would take them to the lessons from the story video and playback. And then again, they could watch it. And then you could bring them back, like I said, into a discussion panel like this, where they reflect and, and talk about some of the questions that you've created. Uh, the nice thing about Brightspace is they can do that sort of as an ongoing discussion thread so they can share their responses and then others, students can respond to theirs. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's sort of a very quick overview in terms of how that resource can be embedded into our new virtual classrooms that are, are now very much part of our reality. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, I'm guessing, Jody or Priya. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say it's very helpful being married to somebody who's a tech genius. <laughs> um, so thank you, Kevin, who's sitting across from me <laughs> in our new home and online environment. Um, so maybe what we'll do is I know we're having, uh, like we're coming to the end of time um, and we will share with you um, a feedback link. Um, that we have uh, in order to uh, get your feedback and stuff. But if there's any questions, um, if you wanna pop them in the chat box right now um, for either myself or Kevin or Isaac, um, uh, let's, we can take a few minutes for any questions that have, may have come up. And maybe while we're waiting, if there's any questions, perhaps Isaac, if there's any other things that you wanted to share in regards to this resource, I know we, we wanted to give the time to you to share the story because that's really what, that's the magic in all of this. Um, but if there's anything else you wanted to talk about. Um, I just want to thank uh, all of you for working so hard. Uh, Kevin, wow, that's, that's the first time I I seen that. That's really incredible. Uh, so Kevin, amazing. You you I'm like uh, a big fan of yours over here in Northern Ontario. Um, yes, this the way that it's set up. It's easy. It's accessible. It's uh, you know it's good. Um, but it's also I think fun. And so when you go through the the lessons and when you go through all of the the different options you kind of get lost in, in it and you can really have a lot of fun with it. And that's the, I think that's the biggest idea is exploring, um, you know, who we are, our place on this earth, who we are as humans and also having fun doing it too. And so, you know, hats off to all of those that have worked so hard um, to, to make this resource happen and uh, you know, give it a shot, give it a try and, and see what happens. And just, just like anything, um, the more you get familiar with something, the easier it becomes to, to use. And so, you know, I think that um, definitely it's something worth looking into. I'm very proud of everybody that, that has participated in, in this project. It's just been amazing uh, right from the very start. Um, and of course, you can reach me at ojibweconnections at gmail.com. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to give me an, uh, an email. Um, there's a very good chance I'm never going to respond to you because um, <laughs> I'm not an email guy. Um, but email me anyway. Um, Jody is, is definitely um, Jody Williams at dpcdsb.org. Um, Jody's really good at stuff like that. Um, I just have a hard time with emails. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but um, but there's other ways to connect to me too. So um, I really like answering questions and stuff. So if you get a hold of Jody, and then and then Jody can say, "Hey, such and such teacher wants to talk to you," then I'd I'd rather just call you on the phone because I can't I can't sit there my whole life like this because I'm busy. So I can't sit, sit there my whole life typing all all time. Um, I live in the bush and I, and, I, and I only have so much access to signals and computers and things like that. Um, so 
so the, the best way to get a hold of me is through Jody, but I would love to, of course, connect with you and your students. Um, if, if there's a, an opportunity where you want me to speak to your class and your students, I'm sure that we could make that happen too, uh, which is something I love to do. I love being involved with students and I love telling stories. And so if there's a way to, to make that happen, I'd be open to it, of course. Um, so again, thank you. Um, I, I have to depart a couple of minutes early. I have a safety meeting that I have to attend to. And uh, it's very important because it's involving uh, COVID-19. So with that, uh, I wish everybody, uh, you know, a good, safe, uh, and very, you know, be safe. You know, things are going to be okay. Look after each other, help each other out. There's lots of, of, of room where people need help. So if you can, in your own way, seek out those that need help uh, with, with COVID. Maybe they need, they need masks, they need gloves, they need funds. Um, you know, do what you can to, to help those that, that might not have them. And, uh, you know, all the best to you. And, and again, thank you, Jody and team, uh, for all the hard work that you do. Uh, this, this has just been amazing. I, I love this every time. Thank you so, so thank much, you Isaac. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'm, hey, your I'm going to be your personal secretary. <laughs> um, yeah, so please, um, yeah, so feel free. Um, check us out on Twitter as well. Um, and Priya has put in the link to our feedback. Um, so maybe if there's anything that you're interested in learning more, perhaps it's spending more time um, uh, building your online classrooms, we're happy to help with that. I'm happy to volunteer my husband uh, to do that. And uh, we, are, we do have plans to try and continue to bring in language. That is a big priority. Um, I should mention also that this is a Catholic resource, so you'll notice in there, because it was um, funded through the work of Dufferin Peel, um, so there's links in there in the lesson activities that link into um, our Catholic social teachings and virtues um, and things like that. And um, there was, I think, a question somewhere that emerged um, in regards to uh, FNMI EAO, and if boards, many school boards have a license, which means it's uh, it's been provided for anyone who's in that school board. So, for example, um, if I was to use my school board, so we have a um, you get a generic username and password that's unique to your school board that you, is shared out. And if you're not sure, you can email info at FNMI EAO. And I'll get Priya to just put that into um, the chat box. Um, you can inquire if your school board already has a license. And if so, then um, you're good to go. Uh, if not, you might want to look, uh, um, contact your Indigenous education lead for your board um, and let them know that this is an option. This is a new thing that we had to do this year. We didn't want to have to charge a membership fee, but um, we, when the Ford government came in, all, all the grants that we would normally be able to access are no longer available. Um, and so in order for us to exist and do this really good work, um, we had to apply a small membership fee. And this really um, is important because it, you know, it really, it helps, you know, when we have, when we bring our elders advisory council together, which now we have to wait, um, but, you know, it covers, it helps to cover the cost of of doing stuff like that or bringing in guest speakers like this or um, helping run our live events and conferences. So, um, so it's, you know, and when we talk about reciprocity and giving back, um, it's one small way we can, uh, we can help support grassroots organizations um, that uh, keep this good learning going and moving forward. So I just want to thank everyone for taking the time out today. Um, and uh, Stay tuned for more um, workshops or online webinars. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so that's it from us. And we'll follow up with, um, there's an exit ticket Priya's put in the chat box, but we'll follow up with an email as well with the link to the recording. It does, I should mention, it does take a little while um, for it to get posted onto our website, but we send out the link to all those who's registered um, in advance. So. Again, thank you for joining. Thank you, Tina and Priya and Kevin um, for all of your work.
in making this happen.